Okay. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will no longer exist. Grief, crying, and pain will exist no longer because the previous things have passed away. Amen. Happy Sabbath again, everyone. Before I get started, I just wanted to say that I have practiced this a lot, <laughs> but I ask that you bear with me because I'm not sure how my emotions will fare as I go through it today. Let's bow our heads. Dear God, I am not a preacher, but I am your child who wishes to speak to your people. Help me to deliver a message that encourages them in some way and help them to hear that message fully. Amen. It is a shadow that refuses to leave you alone. It is the silence that deafens your home. It is like trying to find your way in the dark. It is a million tiny splinters attacking your heart. It is the journey down an everlasting road. It is like a landmine waiting to explode. It is a chronic condition that has no cure. It is the desperate cry of words unheard. It is like drowning in an ocean you cannot escape. It is a nightmare from which you never wake. It is the memories that are all you have left. It is like a heavy weight that sits on your chest. It is a piece of you that has no chance of being replaced. It is the ugly scar that nothing in this world can erase. It is like receiving a rose, only to discover many thorns. It is a constant reminder of the one you mourn. Grief, the title of the poem that I just read to you, which I myself wrote not too long ago, is also the subject of my message today. July 8, 2017, was, is, and will probably always be the worst day of my entire life. It was the day that I lost my father. I remember getting a call from my mother that day. She was very brief. All she said was, you need to get to the hospital as soon as you can. Your dad's here. She hung up. And so I thought, Okay, well, he has gone to the hospital twice before, once for a pulled muscle in his back and another for a bad reaction to a medication that he was supposed to be taking at the time. And so I figured it's probably something minor that he just couldn't deal with at home. And so I arrive at the hospital, and I go to the ladies at the front desk, and I mention his name. And they look at each other kind of funny, and then one tells me to follow her. And I thought, that's odd. Why won't you give me a room number? And as I followed her through the automatic doors, expecting to go straight to all the patient rooms, I was surprised to instead take an immediate right into a small little room. It had a couple couches, a couple chairs. There wasn't much in there. But I did notice immediately that my Aunt Tammy and my mother were sitting in there. And I noticed the state my mother was in. She was sitting there with her head bowed and her face in her hands. So I went over and I knelt down in front of her. I said, what is it, Mom? What's wrong? And when she looked up at me, I recognized the fact that I've never seen her look more exhausted in my entire life. And all she said was, I'm sorry. Your father had a massive heart attack and he didn't make it. And I remember out of instinct, turning around and looking for my father as a source of comfort. And for the first time in my entire life, he wasn't there. Now you see, my father was a rare individual. He was a man of compassion, strength, intelligence, humor, honesty, selflessness, determination, patience, wisdom, and faith. Despite all the cruelty and darkness in this world, 
My father had one of the purest and grandest hearts that have ever been blessed to beat. No matter how bad of a day it had been, my father always knew exactly how to make someone laugh until their pain had completely vanished. Regardless of his well-earned exhaustion, my father continually worked harder and with more strive than anyone else that I have ever known. Indifferent to whatever state his body, mind, and soul were in, my father faithfully went to church every Saturday as a worthy man of God. Without faltering, my father always jumped at the opportunity to help all those around him with any task, big or small. But most importantly, my father knew how to love his father and mother, brother and sister, wife and daughters, family and friends, in ways that I can only dream I am capable of doing so that he can one day be proud. As my beloved mother has said, there was no better person than John Ward. And so, as I went throughout the rest of that day and the following week thereafter, all I could think was, why? Why would a person of this caliber, a person who is beautiful in all forms of the word, a person who has been my greatest hero for my entire life, die? I remember when my mother said those words to me, I immediately got this ringing sensation inside my ears. Have any of you ever had that? Where it just keeps building and building until it's the only thing you hear. It deafens everything else out. And in my shock, I remember inwardly exclaiming, no, my dad? Why is this happening? I remember that night, I was thinking about stories in the Bible related to death. And I immediately thought of the story of Lazarus. Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 11, verses 21 through 27. Let me know when you're there. John chapter 11, verses 21 through 27. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Now instead of focusing on the true message behind this passage, which discusses the promise of eternal life, I instead immediately and illogically focused on how it was possible for Jesus to bring Lazarus back from the dead, and therefore thought that my father could be brought back also. I remember myself saying, okay, God, you did it once, do it again. A few days later, on Monday, some of us in the family had to go to the funeral home to make preparations for the visitation and the funeral. And as they let us into the room, there's one thing I will never forget. And to take the words from my sister, Molly, every wall in that room was lined with coffins on display like purses. And I remember as we sat down and started making our preparations, I just shut down and I grew distant. But I remember sitting there thinking, why am I sitting here? How did I end up sitting here? Again, later that night, I was thinking about stories in the Bible related to death, and this time I thought of the story of Jesus being resurrected. Let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 39. Let me know when you're there. Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 39. 
Now here it's discussing that upon word that Jesus had risen from the grave on the third day, the disciples, in disbelief, were all discussing with each other the news when Jesus appeared to them, saying in verse 36, Peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened, and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see me, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. Then the disciples, still in disbelief, fed Jesus, and he opened the scriptures to their understanding. Jump down with me to verse 46. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Once again, instead of focusing on the true message behind the passage, I instead immediately and more desperately than the first time focused on how Jesus was brought back from the dead and therefore thought that my father could be also saying again, okay, God, you did it once, do it again, please. Up until this point, I had this delusion in my head that since I had not seen my father since the day before he passed, he was still somehow alive. I figured he probably picked up another shift at the hospital, or he's out helping somebody with something. He'll be home soon. Why have I been told that he's dead? The last time that I saw my father was Friday morning. I was heading to work, and I wouldn't be home afterwards. And so I walked down the hallway to my parents' bedroom and saw him sitting in his recliner. He had already read the newspaper, and he was reading his devotion, as he did every day. And I just said simply, I'm going to work now, and I won't be back tonight because I'm going to Destiny's house. I'll see you at church tomorrow. And he looked up at me really peacefully and smiled and said, okay. Turns out I wasn't at church the following morning. And that was due to the fact that what I could probably describe would be the worst migraine I've ever had in my entire life. And perhaps that was a sign for the day to come. But I remember as I stood up to go to the bathroom just to get ready for church, that I immediately fell into the wall because I was so dizzy I couldn't even stand. And so I figured, well, I definitely can't drive like this. And I probably shouldn't sit in church like this. So it's in my best interest that I should probably stay home and rest. And that's what I did. I know I could have never seen what was to come later on in the afternoon, but I will always regret not having one last Sabbath with my father. And then the next day, it came time for the private family visitation, where the casket was open so that we could see my father one last time. And I remember, as they led us through the foyer and around the corner, how my world just shattered. Because I saw the coffin at the other end of the room. And as we approached it, the truth finally set in. Because it was my father laying there. And I remember as I talked to him and I touched him and I kissed his head and I noticed how he didn't look like himself. His hair was darker brown now, it wasn't blonde anymore. He had dark circles under his eyes, which were never there in life. His hands looked like a much older man's, much, much older man's. And I knew how it would feel, but the shock when I touched him and realized that he was ice cold was the most horrible feeling I think I've ever felt. And as I stood there at 21 years old, saying goodbye to my father, all I could think was, why is this happening to me? That night, at the public visitation, I don't remember much. I only remember becoming numb to it all. I remember all the familiar and unfamiliar faces, the many hugs and I'm sorry's, the stories about my father that I had heard before, and the stories that I had not heard before, the flood of people, the flowers, and how, at the end of the night, none of that really made a difference. 
the following day at the funeral went about the same. I remember walking in and walking out. I remember that it was a nice service. But again, I was numb to it all. The only thing that was clear throughout both the visitation and the funeral was that one consistent thought. Why is this happening? Why is this happening? Grief is defined as deep sorrow, especially in that caused by someone's death. Universally, there are five known stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance which were crafted by author and psychiatrist Elizabeth Kubler-Ross in her book on grief and grieving. We, as in those of us who have lost someone, experience each of these stages in our own form as a way to process our grief. Denial, the first of the five stages of grief, helps us to survive the loss we have endured. In this stage, the world becomes meaningless and overwhelming. Life makes no sense, and we are in a state of shock. We go numb. We wonder how we can go on, if we can go on, and why we should go on. We try to find a way to simply get through each day. Therefore, denial helps us to cope and make survival possible, or it helps us to pace our feelings of grief. Thus, there is a grace in denial, for it is nature's way of letting in only as much as we can handle. As we accept the reality of the loss and start to ask ourselves questions, we are unknowingly beginning the healing process. We are becoming stronger, and the denial is beginning to fade. But as we proceed, all the feelings we were denying begin to surface, which leads us to the second of the five stages of grief, anger. Anger is a necessary stage of the healing process. We need to be willing to feel our anger, even though it may seem endless. The more we truly feel it, the more it will begin to dissipate, and the more we will heal. Unfortunately, though, the truth is that anger has no limits. It can extend not only to our friends, our family, ourselves, the doctors, and even our loved one who died, but also to God. We may ask, where is God in this? However, our anger, which is ultimately rooted in our pain, is actually a sign of strength, and it can be an anchor, giving temporary structure to the nothingness of loss. In other words, our anger is something to hold on to, and is just another indication of the intensity of our love. But as our anger passes, and we may even begin to feel somewhat better, we are led into the third of the five stages of grief bargaining. Before a loss, it seems like we will do anything if only our loved one would be spared. Please, God, we bargain. I will never be angry at this person again if you'll just let them live. We become lost in a maze of if only or what if statements. We want life returned to what it was. We want our loved one restored. We find fault in ourselves and what we think we could have done differently. We remain in the past, trying to do anything to negotiate our way out of the hurt. After bargaining, our attention moves squarely into the present and the fourth of the five stages of grief, depression. Empty feelings present themselves, and grief enters our lives on a deeper level, deeper than we ever imagined. We withdraw from life, left in a fog of intense sadness, Wondering, perhaps, if there is any point in going on alone. Why go on at all? Finally, we are led into the fifth of the five stages of grief, acceptance. Acceptance is often confused with the notion of being okay with what has happened. But this is most certainly not the case. Most people won't ever feel okay about the loss of a loved one. This stage is actually about accepting the reality that our loved one is physically gone and recognizing that this new reality is the permanent reality. We will never like this reality or make it okay, but eventually we accept it and learn to live with it 
and we must try to live now in a world where our loved one is missing. In resistance to this new norm, at first many individuals want to maintain life as it was before a loved one died. However, in time, through bits and pieces of acceptance, we see that we cannot maintain the past intact because it has been forever changed. We must readjust. This does not mean that we are abandoning our lost loved one, however, although it may seem that way. Truthfully, we can never replace what has been lost, but we can do our best to start new chapters in our lives and rekindle our relationships with our families, our friends, and even ourselves. Therefore, instead of denying our feelings, we learn to listen to our needs. We move, we change, we grow, we evolve. Eventually, we begin to live again. Now, as most of you know, I was born into this church, and I have been here all my life. So I've grown up knowing God, knowing the Bible, and knowing the Seventh-day Adventist message. Of course, like most individuals, I have battled back and forth with my faith, with equal highs and lows. I've both seen God's work, and I've doubted God's existence but I have never really strayed away. I don't have any grand find yourself stories that troubled my relationship with God due to being led into the bad things of the world. I have been and am a normal church going, God loving individual. However, in the unexpected death of my father, my relationship with God is being severely tested. As I stated before, there are five universal stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. However, most of the time, <clears throat> individuals fail to mention that rather than going through all of these stages, one at a time, in order, you usually feel all of them at once, at every waking moment of every single day. For my own personal journey, I can feel myself being pulled two separate ways and dealing with my own version of the stages of grief. There is a grief side and there is a logical side. I deny that my father is gone, but I know that I saw him lying there in that coffin. I am angry at myself, at my father, at my loved ones, and at the medical world, and at God for not saving him when at least one of those parties had the power to do so but I know that it's really no one's fault but Satan. I bargain with the idea of what if there was a way to reverse time and bring my father back, but I know that nothing can truly be done to change what has happened. I am sad at every second, minute, and hour of every single day, but I mask it because I don't want those who love me to see me in such a way when they themselves are already irreversibly broken enough. I accept that for whatever horrible and unknown reason that my, someone as extraordinary as my father had to die long before he ever should have. But I still believe that I am only dreaming and that when I wake up, there he will be also. Thus, throughout everything that I have gone through in the past year, throughout my grief, I have come to the realization that I am completely broken, and yet I am also whole. By this, I mean that grief can either destroy you or change your life for the better. It depends on you as to how it does or does not define you. How many of you have ever lost someone that was so important to you that their loss changed your life forever? Over the past year, I have personally learned that grief is not something that can be overcome. It is something that inescapably becomes a part of who you are, woven into your identity forever in both a beautiful and tragic way. It shapes you into something brand new, for the previous version of yourself has passed away, and you can never return to who you once were, nor to your past. Fortunately, though, this does not extinguish the incredible hope for what lies ahead for you and your future, both in the good and the bad. Where there is deep sorrow, 
there was and still is deep love, as well as the promise for a better tomorrow. So, I will talk about my father, not because I'm stuck or because I haven't moved on, but I will talk about him because I am his and he is mine, and no amount of time or even death will ever change that. The power of that knowledge lovingly reminded me of just how many things my father taught me in my life. But there are two things that have always stuck with me in particular that to this day I still hear him say in my mind. The first one was, even in uncertainty and death, love lasts forever. And the second one was, to always treat everyone that you know and do not know, no matter what, just as Jesus Christ would treat them. I believe that he lived by both of these statements without faltering each and every single day of his short but beautiful and meaningful life. And I can only hope that I too may grow to live by these statements as well. Now, to lighten things up a little, you might be saying you know a lot about my father, but there are some other things that I think I should share with you all that you may or may not have known about him. My father was loud. Yes, the reserved, calm, respectable man that you saw in church was actually the loudest person ever. Like annoyingly loud. Whether it was singing along to Scotty Dill's CD so loud in the car that it made our ears ring, or yelling so loud about one of his favorite sports teams losing to the point that you could hear him all the way downstairs. He was very unapologetically loud. And on top of that, he was a total goofball. Just like my uncles, Carrie and Larry, he was always cracking jokes or teasing you mercilessly because it was just that much fun or too easy for him. If you made a mistake, you set yourself up for disaster, seriously. He was also a father figure and role model to everyone, not just his daughters. Just ask any of my cousins or my best friend. Whether it was roughhousing or playing sports with my cousins, Tyler, Joseph, and Kevin, and most recently my second cousins, Jax, Paisley, and Reagan, or playing in the pool and building epic sand castles on the beach with myself, Molly, or my other cousins, Meredith and Hannah, my father was the perfect definition of being a big kid at heart. I also know that, although he unfortunately didn't get the chance to meet the new addition to our family, my nephew Wesley, my father will perfectly fit the role of grandfather when we get to heaven. However, when the time came to be serious, or while experiencing difficult periods in our lives, he was also a prime example of what it meant to be both a good father and a deeply admirable man by consistently illustrating what it meant to be responsible, calm, wise, sentimental, courageous, and firm in one's attributes and beliefs. So, as we all grew older, and as my best friend, Destiny, had the privilege to get to know him on a deeply personal level for several years, it became clear to us that no matter what background we came from, what situation we were in, what mistakes we had made, what victories we had won, or what paths we had chosen along the way. Everyone should have someone in their lives that embodied what it meant to not only have a physical home, but a home in the heart of a special loved one. How lucky we are to have had someone like that in my father. My father was a picky eater, with a capital P. There have only been a handful of others in my entire life that I have met that are as ridiculous about what food they eat as he was. I'm not kidding. Sometimes it seems like my mother would have to tie his hands around his back and force him to eat something. And on top of that, there were other things that he would never even touch, such as beans, which he always incorrectly stated tasted like dirt. For as much as he loved to eat, he sure was extremely difficult about it. My father loved the beach and the mountains. He always looked forward to going on vacation so that he could either lay out on the beach and go boogie boarding all day, or take a peaceful hike to admire some incredible waterfalls. Some of my best memories of my father were during these vacations. He also loved reality television and classic rock. No, really. He would always be watching shows like Wipeout 
American Idol, Jerry Springer, or WWE Showdown, all while laughing like crazy, or listening to his favorite songs by Pink Floyd or Collective Soul. Now, the reality television, even to this day, is still bizarre to me when I think about the kind of person that he was. But I guess that's just another piece that makes him unique. As for the classic rock, I oftentimes still hear the song Shine by Collective Soul on the radio, which inevitably brings a smile to my face. My father was faithful not only to God, but to his loved ones as well. When his father had a stroke, and was forced to live in a nursing home for the last nine years of his life. He spent countless days and hours sitting by his father's side, simply because the company and compassion was needed in such a depressing and lonely situation. He never complained about the amount of time he spent there, because he simply wanted to be there. He even took the time to build a small stand for his father to hold his Bible while he laid in bed. Unfortunately, though, his father passed away before he ever got the chance to give it to him. I never really got the opportunity to get to know my Papa Ward, but I know that much of my father's character comes from him. And for that, I owe the man who I barely knew so much. He also had a special love for animals. This was first developed through my Nana Ward at a very early age. Nonetheless, it was true throughout his entire life. And my aunt, Tammy, shares this love of animals with him as well. Of course, as I'm sure most of you know, my father was a very kind individual. But I think it takes someone very special to be extraordinarily kind to animals. So much so that, as countless individuals have said, the animals can even sense when you're a good person. And for my father, they always did. Even now, his cat at home Spook mourns him by looking around for him constantly, lying in the places he sat, or perking up when she hears his voice on a home video. And lastly, my father had two main nicknames, Bam Bam and Rain Man. The first was because he was strong and rough. As I'm sure many of you noticed, he was very fit. You could walk down into our basement and see practically an entire gym. He had so many weights, gear, and informational help posters on the wall that you'd think you must have accidentally stumbled into the YMCA, Planet Fitness, or Gold's Gym, rather than someone's home. I always laugh thinking about how my Aunt Lori, an equal health and fitness fanatic, would love to talk fitness jargon with him that literally no one else would understand. This strength, in turn, also made him a roughhouser. He would play with everyone, such as during our rounds of pretend boxing in the kitchen, in such an unintentionally rough manner that one of us would eventually yell, Ow, Bam Bam! Or, when something around the house needed to be done, he would attack the task so vigorously that he would often get himself hurt, such as when he was wiping down the dashboard of Molly's car so aggressively that he slammed his hand into the side of the windshield and broke his thumb, making one of us say, Take it easy, Bam Bam! The second nickname was because my father was wickedly smart when it came to math. Now, I know what you're saying. Well, he was a church's treasurer. No, like he was almost too smart when it came to math. In fact, his brain was a calculator. He could do any math problem in his head in a matter of moments. And on top of that, to prove his intelligence and to proudly dance all over our lack thereof, he would randomly spout ridiculously long and difficult math problems for one of us to do. And when we sat there like, and couldn't figure it out, he'd throw his head back and laugh. So, anytime there was a math problem or something to be solved, one of us would say, take it away, Rain Man. I personally have also learned something else about my father since he passed away, which has been particularly special to me because it connects us on a very deep level. My father was a writer. For starters, he was a closet poet. I had no idea that in the first few years that he and my mother were together, that he wrote three poems dedicated to her. And to my surprise, they were very good. I won't go into detail, but I can say that, not to my surprise. They were very touching, romantic, and considerate. My father also wrote a few other poems, one very sweet one about grandmothers, and another titled, Fear God, 
which he wrote, as he comically noted at the bottom of the poem, in 15 minutes after hearing Elderstein's sermon in December of 1985. This one I will share with you. The Bible tells us to fear God and give glory to his name. If we don't, the consequences we suffer are only our blame. We should trust and fear him and none other. Follow his son's example and not that of our mortal brother. Because if all we're after is worldly wealth and fame, in the end, our heads will be hung in shame. If you take lightly his message and not give it much thought, you will waste the ticket that Christ's death on the cross bought. If you do not fear God and follow in his ways, the Bible tells us, numbered are your days. Because we all know the judgment day is soon to come, when the wicked will be destroyed and the followers receive a heavenly kingdom. So take heed this warning and accept his undying love, and you'll live in everlasting peace with the good Lord up above. Other than being a closet poet, my father also wrote letters to some of my family members in their time of grief, both of which were in the loss of my great-grandmother, Elizabeth. One was written to my Aunt Linda and Uncle Joe, who took her into their home and cared for her in her last year. The other was written directly to my Nana and Papa Ketchy, as it was his mother who we had lost. Just as with the poems, these two letters were incredibly heartfelt and thoughtful. However, there is one important piece from the letter to my aunt and uncle that I want to share, because in reading it for the first time after my father passed away, it sent chills down my spine. In the letter, my father was detailing how, in his conversation with my mother the night Elizabeth passed away, he told her, we are lucky to have the families that we do have, because when sickness and death do hit, it hurts so deeply. We are somehow drawn closer together to draw strength from each other, to carry on. On the worst day of my entire life, the day that I lost my father, the last thing that he ever said to my mother was to keep going. Personally, I don't think of this as a coincidence, nor simply an answer to the question that she had asked him. I think in a strange and beautiful way, it was a message straight from God, through my father, that was meant for my mother, myself, and our family. When you are happy, keep going. When you are sad, keep going. When you have a wonderful thing happen in your life, keep going. When you have a terrible thing happen in your life, keep going. When you have faith in God, keep going. When you doubt God, keep going. Even when you have to face crippling grief through the loss of one of the most important individuals in your entire life, keep going. No matter what happens in your life, good or bad, no matter what victories or losses you may face, no matter what beauty or tragedy life puts in your path, until you see God come down from the heavens with Jesus Christ and all the holy angels, to wake the dead, and finally bring you and all your loved ones home together. Keep going. Keep going. Before our closing hymn, I would like for you all to watch a video that I've put together that may let you get to know my father a little bit better than you may have before. He was the best son, the, the best, best brother. brother, the best husband, the, the best, best dad, the best uncle, and the best person for anyone to have in their life. There was no better person than John Ward.
Well, we're gonna keep this film so you can see how sassy you are as a kid. How are you, Meredith? Meredith, how are you now? <laughs> Ooh, push my heart in the face. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. Put her in the face again. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna be a boxer? You're just gonna beat your sister up. Does it really got, hurt? She got that fist. She's looking at that fist. Punch her again. Punch her again. So laugh him again, I'll punch you again. <laughs> Look at me. <laughs> you can't escape the eye of the camera. Oh, brother, found our eggs. Spit it out. You love Daddy? Yeah, I got one out. <laughs> 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 we got some paper.